Our factory tours have gotten increasingly low level, like a painting factory and a sheet metal supplier. But today we're taking a step back down the factory supply chain to cover a power supply factory. This is the first of two videos we'll be posting on the process of making a power supply. Part one, this one, is physical assembly, and part two will cover R&D for new designs. This factory is responsible for assembling, QC testing, stress testing, researching and developing, and packing finished power supplies for a lot of the brands that you recognize. Our host for this one was Cooler Master, which uses this factory to source a lot of their power supplies. Cooler Master and many of its competitors who also use this factory work with the factory during the early research and development stages and provide an idea of what they want. We'll talk about that process in the second video. But they also use this factory to do the final assembly and testing of all the power supplies going to market all the way down to shrink wrapping the box. Before that, this video is brought to you by the new Be Quiet Straight Power 11 Platinum Power Supply Series, available from 550 watts to 1200 watts. The new Straight Power 11 is platinum certified, operating more efficiently than before, reducing heat and lowering noise levels as a result. The Be Quiet Straight Power 11 Platinum is up to 94.1% efficient and meets the new low power standards of just 0.16 watts when in standby. Learn more about this high-end, noise-focused power supply at the link in the description below. Cooler Master was our host for this tour, but they're just one of many clients to this factory, which has requested to remain unnamed. There aren't many power supply factories, and most of them are in China, although this one is in Tainan, on the southern end of Taiwan. This PSU factory does a lot of R&D and testing, but as far as assembly goes, it mostly takes partially completed kits from factories in China and then adds the rest of the assembly. What we can say is that they manufacture Cooler Master power supplies, among other products, and that they employ 120 sales and office staff and 80 assembly workers at this location, although it was quieter than usual during our visit because of supply chain issues from human malware. The factory produces power supplies for a lot of the other brands that you're familiar with too, but those weren't on assembly during our visit. The first step of assembling a power supply is the service mount technology, or SMT line, and automated optical inspection line. We didn't see this happening because it's done at factories in China, but we have extremely thorough coverage of the SMT process at multiple factories in our previous tours. Last year, most recently, we looked at it at Gigabyte's Taiwanese motherboard factory from Nanping Road from our tour in 2019. This is the same process for motherboards as it is for power supplies, so we'll recap some of that content briefly before getting into this specific factory's work. Bare PCBs are loaded onto a line and solder is screen printed onto pads as a paste. The PCB is purchased from an entirely different factory that we'll need to tour separately. The application of the solder paste is then inspected optically using AOI machines and if it's done correctly, the PCBs move on to a pick and place machine where SMDs are loaded onto the board. The pick and place machines are the most fun to watch. They're like a Gatling gun or a machine gun that's fed a reel of ammo and punched down onto the board. They can knock out most parts in under a minute, although the boards have to go through multiple pick and place machines in a specific order. The largest components are typically added last, as the bigger cylindrical capacitors or other large parts get in the way of the machine when it's placing smaller parts. It can work more efficiently if those large objects aren't on the board for it to work around earlier because it'll have more room to move. Some boards have thousands of service mount and through hole components on them, so this process has to be automated and has to be precise, programs for each product being made. The machines use reels of small components, often measured in 10,000 units at a time, and are programmed to eat components and spit them back out onto the PCBs. RAM, SSDs, motherboards, power supplies, and video cards are all made this way. The boards are next loaded via conveyor belt into a reflow oven to melt the paste into liquid solder, which hardens into strong joints. We have footage from MSI's factory in 2019 where you can see the parts moved over a lake of molten solder with the legs dipping into it. A literal brick of solder is loaded onto a scale which is then slowly dipped into a molten lake over time. As the weight changes, it gets increasingly lower and melts. For QC of potential defects with solder, each of these bricks is marked and tracked with a number. If the manufacturer has a supplier level defect with the solder, they'd know exactly which power supplies or motherboards in this footage were made with that brick of solder, so they could easily pull those units from the line or recall them and then make any claims they might want to make with the supplier. After all of this, more automatic optical inspection is involved, circuit testing is done, and any manual effort is done. 
For video cards and motherboards, that include placement of heat sinks or some large components that sometimes have to be done by hand, often including CPU sockets. For power supplies, that include internal heat sinks for parts inside of the unit or some of the larger components. If you want to learn all the really detailed processes for service mount technology and the lines that manufacture the PCBs before this factory is put into play, then watch our Gigabyte Factory tour video that's linked in the description below. We cut it short here just for a quick recap before talking about the rest of the power supply manufacturing process and left out a lot of the finer details that can be found in our previous coverage. We won't know exactly how closely this company's process matches Gigabyte's until we get an opportunity to visit their China factory, but SMT lines are standardized and mostly all the same. Arrival in Tainan is point B in the power supply's journey. The power supplies are in pieces and shipped as separate cases, fans, and guts from China partly for quality control reasons and partly to meet tariff requirements. This factory needs to provide about 35% value on the product to help offset tariff impact, and so it handles the remainder of assembly, testing, and R&D. Some parts, like the chassis, come from lower down supply chain companies. Although Lian Li, to our knowledge, doesn't supply this factory with cases, its factory would be a good analog to how these are made. As another breakout, let's look at some of that. Chassis components for any product are made the same way as a computer case, just at a smaller scale. You've got two extremes for this. On one hand, Cooler Master's highly automated factory in Huizhou, China, is one of the most advanced we've ever seen. It's got rows upon rows of fully automated arms that move and place metal from one punch or stamp to the next. They get pressed, bent, and prepped for assembly or painting in these lines. On the other hand, Lian Li's highly manual factory gives it much more flexibility for rapid change orders, but it's obviously slower. That factory has manual bending machines, laser cutters that deal with finer details, and punch machines that rapidly riddle the panel with holes and make large cutouts, like for a power supply in the back of a case. You can watch our recent Lian Li metalworking video linked below for more information on this individual process. Once the case and parts have been delivered to the Tainan PSU factory, before anything else, the barcode of each power supply is scanned. This is wired to a diagnostic computer for a simple software test, every power supply is associated with an ID, and the factory in China extensively tests the power supplies and logs data using that same ID. Both factories link to each other using a software solution called Shop Floor for testing and logging throughout the factory, running on good old Windows XP. Tests done in Taiwan, other than burn-in, are just to double check and make sure that nothing has been damaged during transportation. Anything damaged or failing QC is sent back to the factory in China. Before going any further, the power supplies must be reassembled. This is simple work and only requires a small line of workers. Some glue down internal components, some screw in fans, some apply warranty stickers, and some assemble the finished units. Testing for the fans is also done here to make sure they turn on and spin. This floor can spin up at least four more lines of assembly stations, but only one was operating for our visit. That's because this was filmed in early March, when China was still reeling from factory shutdowns due to the pandemic. The layout of this room is flexible, and there's plenty of space to set up more lines when the supply stabilizes. We were told that this one line can process about 80 units per hour. The ubiquitous green coatings on the conveyor belt and on the floor are an ESD-resistant material that we've seen in many of our previous factory tours. While the half gloves are to protect the power supply casing from fingerprints as much as possible, while still allowing dexterity. Electrostatic discharge is taken seriously in these factories because it is one of the more common killers of components when you're dealing with millions of units. For this reason, the factory controls it with the green coating you see everywhere. At the end of this line is a high potential or high pot tester. Again, the PSUs are thoroughly tested before they're ever sent to Taiwan, so this is really just to double check the results from the other factory. Three quick tests are performed here to ensure IEC compliance. The factory manager mentioned IEC standards 62368 and 60906 in particular if you'd like to read on those, although more tests also get done. Two of these are a high amperage test at 8 volts and 25 amps, and a high voltage test at 1800 volts and 10 milliamps. If the power supplies fail these or the earlier software test, they're shipped back to the original factory for repair. Every single power supply must pass through this assembly and testing line and be issued a pass or a fail. After verification comes the brand new test, burn it. Burn in is almost exactly what it sounds like, heavily loading every power supply and raising its temperature for a worst case scenario stress test to check the traces on the PCB and general reliability. At this point in the process, the company already knows that the fan and the board should be able to handle the spec 
because it's gone through R&D, so it's just making sure that each individual unit works as designed. Mid-tier units, like the ones being tested during our visit, the cabinets were marked 500 watts, are run at 40 degrees Celsius in the cabinets, while higher end units are tested at 50 degrees Celsius, with big air ducts above each cabinet to exhaust the heated air and maintain a constant temperature. 80% load is applied to all rails simultaneously for the full duration of this test. There are two banks of burn-in cabinets with 80 power supply bays per side for a total capacity of 320 units. Each bay has an 800 watt maximum, so higher wattage power supplies take up two bays and have the capacity of the cabinets. If testing 800 watt or 1000 watt units, for instance, the factory might cut down to 160 units or fewer, partly to ensure that they don't trip the breakers. At peak, one side of this cabinet consumes about 63 kilowatts, and multiple cabinets are present, one for each brand. Each brand gets its own positioning, so companies who aren't Cooler Master are also in the same room. Hundreds of kilowatts are consumed here at any given time. The cabinets can test at both 110 volts and 220 volts, so each batch of power supplies is tested at the voltage of its target market. 110 for the US, for example, and 220 elsewhere. Every single production PSU goes through this testing process for one to two hours, while in development units get tested for 24 hours. If you've purchased a Cooler Master power supply, there's a good chance it came through here, and a lot of other brands that we can't name also. But there's a really good chance that a power supply you've purchased recently has gone through this line. The modular PSU cables used in the cabinets aren't the ones destined to ship with the units. They're just part of the jig that each PSU is connected to. Testing of the real cables happens in China, and they're supplied by an entirely different third-party supplier from either of these factories. If you want to see how some of the cables are made, you can watch our USB Type-C cable factory tour from last year. The test jigs also contain temperature sensors and diagnostic LEDs. From one point of view, this process inherently wastes energy by having a bunch of power supplies burn power without doing real work, but it is trying to prevent RMAs, which would be a bigger waste still. We were told that the cabinets can recycle 60% of the energy used by storing it in a battery and then converting it back to AC power through an inverter. This is one of the most important engineering feats in this building because it cuts massive power bills down significantly. Because the power supplies have been so thoroughly tested beforehand, only 1-2% to fail at this stage in the pipeline, which can also be due to sensor error with false negatives. Regardless of whether the power supplies pass or fail the burn-in, their next stop is the chroma tester to ensure that they still function and check for any failure symptoms that might be present. Chroma is just a brand name and the chroma testers are actually racks containing several machines and load generators, including eight chroma brand electronic loads per rack. The bottom rack of four loads is higher wattage and the top one is lower wattage, making it easy to plug and test power supplies without reconfiguring the loads each time. Multiple racks are set up across the room so that technicians can quickly process the big 320 unit batches that come out of the burn-in cabinet. This station is where efficiency and voltage ripple are tested. Intel's ATX 12 volt standard for voltage ripple is 120 millivolts, but these power supplies are tested to achieve 60 to 80 millivolt ripple, tighter than the requirement laid out in the spec. Failures over voltage ripple are extremely uncommon. This is something that's been resolved in the development stage, and voltage ripple should remain constant among power supplies that have been verified functional up to this point. The efficiency ratings listed on the side of the power supply, on the sticker, give some idea of what the efficiency testing is checking for but the chroma tester is even more thorough than that, checking against a spec provided by Cooler Master additionally. Testing is brief, in spite of all of this, with workers taking about 30 seconds per power supply as we watched. Each brand goes through its own conveyor belt of chroma testers. About 200 feet away from the chroma tester line is the QC and packaging line. The PSUs are visually inspected one last time and the cables are bundled up with twist ties for shipping. Stickers are applied and fingerprints are wiped off, and this must be done manually because precise placement of the stickers is required, and the power supply models being packaged change one to two times per day, and even more than that when there are supply side issues. Automation isn't flexible enough to be practical in this case. The brand sticker, the product information label, the barcode, and additional warranty seals are all applied, including the ones that we don't like, and that requires a lot of flexibility. The barcode allows tracking the power supply's entire testing history for RMA purposes, and previous automatic optical inspection photos from the SMT line give a reference of what the board looked like before the user got it. This helps the factory, if it's so desired, to figure out if an RMA was the user's fault or an issue at the factory level. 
The extent of QC in both China and Taiwan is for liability purposes as well as for preventing the RMAs. But customers and users, like our audience, will still often blame the power supply first when troubleshooting. How returns are handled differs based on the company selling the power supply, but this factory does no refurbishment on site, and Cooler Master does no first party refurbishment anymore. Instead, Cooler Master often cross ships a known good unit to the customer right away, because without it, you don't have a working computer at all, and the returned units, functional or not, are gathered up and sent to China to be sold to a third party for testing, who may choose to refurbish and resell them, or maybe put them in another system. We asked whether the factory would cut down on its expensive QC process if customers, like Cooler Master, didn't ask for all the extra steps, and we were told no. Testing any less thoroughly isn't worth the liability to have a customer, again, not an end user, but a power supply manufacturer, yelling at the factory over failures, so they'd rather spend the time dealing with the overhead. Multiple power supply makers have told us in the past that PSU failure is relatively uncommon. Most customers return them because the fan isn't spinning, thinking that it's dead when it's actually a feature. A lot of others return units because some other part failed, and the power supply gets blamed first. Many years ago, Corsair told us that a lot of its legitimate RMAs are from dead roaches and ants getting zapped in the power supply and either bridging parts or causing airflow issues. Our hearts go out to the RMA team dealing with that. Although there is no refurbishing done here, there is a minor repair station with some soldering equipment nearby. This station is used mostly for auditory issues, which means a cable bumping into a fan blade and rattling. If there's any problem too serious to be fixed by moving or gluing down a cable, the whole unit gets shipped back to China for repair. Once power supplies are fully tidied up and covered with stickers, they move down the conveyor belt to be packaged in a bubble bag and boxed with their cables and accessories. Cables and transformers used in the power supplies are manufactured in China rather than Taiwan, but material shortages may change this as well. Labor cost is one of the biggest differences. Bagging and boxing is also an entirely manual process, which is expensive, but automation isn't worth the risk of scratching the power supplies. Again, the products being packaged change constantly, so flexibility is key. This is the same thing we talked about with Lian Li's Case Factory versus Cooler Masters. They specialize in different things. Automation is great for high volume, but bad for on-the-fly changes since it requires reprogramming that can take days of doing and testing. Manual labor is bad for huge volume, but great for making smaller orders rapidly and making quick changes to those orders. Completed packages are weighed at the end of the line. 20 packages are weighed beforehand to find the average correct weight, and every package after that must fall within a 20 gram range of this number to confirm that no cables are missing. The scale is connected to a light. Green is good, yellow is too light, and red is too heavy. There are four QC lines at this factory alone, 10 total in Taiwan, and 20 in China, where the primary QC process takes place. There are at least 30 QC steps per power supply made, which helps illustrate why power supplies have one of the lowest actual failure rates out of all the components in the industry. If you ever think your power supply is dead, try troubleshooting everything else first, because there's a good chance that it's not. Finally, the packaged power supplies move on to the shrink wrap machine. By the time we reached this point, our host had learned to anticipate us asking what every single machine costs. So he volunteered that the wrapping machine and the oven together cost approximately 1 million NTD, or New Taiwan Dollars, or about 33,000 USD at the time of writing. This machine consists of a conveyor belt that carries boxes under a frame holding a plastic sheet, which is wrapped around the box and heat sealed into a loose bag. The box then travels into a 160 degree Celsius oven, where the plastic bag is rapidly heated and shrinks around the box. Our hosts opened the oven for us to get a better shot, but it most normally operates closed to retain the heat. This whole process takes seconds, and the shrink-wrapped boxes are immediately cool enough to handle. That concludes the physical assembly and testing process for power supplies. In part two, we'll explore the deeper R&D side of how power supplies are designed and the lab where prototypes are tested before production. Subscribe to catch that video and check our entire factory tour playlist below for more of these types of videos. Go to patreon.com slash gamersnexus to help us out directly in making more of these. These trips are extremely expensive, and we fund them through viewer donations like yours. Or you can go to store.gamersnexus.net if you'd like to help us out and get something in exchange. Thanks for watching. We'll see you all next time.